So here I am making a second video. This is a bit surprising to me. I decided to make a first just in response to getting two notices of investigation from the Labour Party um, and wanting to fight back against that and to publicise the processes through which so many of us on the left are being attacked. Um, but I got such an amazing response to that first video that I thought I'd give another video a go. Um, so thank you so much for all the support, solidarity and love. It's hugely appreciated and just makes me feel so much better about the situation that I'm in and, and that somehow we've managed to turn something that is really oppressive and negative into something much more positive and, and solidaristic. So um, there is definitely a lot of um, lefty YouTube video content, but it tends to be, even when it's done by brilliant UK-based people like the... Um, Kevin Eckle and Sean and Tim Brown Toast, who I think are fabulous. Um, it tends to be very focused on kind of US content, sort of responding to people like Dave Rubin and Jordan Peterson. And so I think maybe I can kind of bring in a kind of more UK focused lefty component. Uh, I have to say that an exception to the rule is Daniel Taylor's YouTube channel. Daniel is really great at um, editing these videos for me. Um, and he's a comrade from Hackney and he has his own YouTube channel, Complaints on the Plate, so, which is UK focused, do check that out. So, before I go on to the substance of this video, which is going to be an anatomy of the Labour right, a kind of deep dive into that, um, there is no update on the two previous investigations that are being carried out on me by the Labour Party for anti-Semitism and for breaking confidentiality about the investigations. I have sent the um, investigations team the video response that I did to the second notice of investigation. And I've also submitted a subject access request, which means a request for any information that the party hold about me. Although I don't have great hopes for when I receive that or for what I receive when I do. Um, I think of myself right now as consciously uncoupling from the Labour Party. So that means I am getting off the email lists and the WhatsApp groups, the Facebook groups. Um, I've resigned as my branch vice chair. I'm not going to meetings anymore and, and so on. But I think the problem with thinking about it as conscious uncoupling is that that really relies on both partners to be cooperating in that process. At the moment, I think the Labour Party is much more interested in um, consciously fucking with me than consciously uncoupling. So let's turn to the Labour right. Um, so this is not really specific, I think, just the Labour Party. The struggle between the left and the people who make up the Labour right, whatever we call them, liberals or centrists, won't go away if we leave the Labour Party. It won't go away if the party implodes even. If we want state power, if we're serious about our project of getting state power on the left, then one of the blocks on that, we know not just from our experience in the Corbyn movement, but historically when we look at how situations in other countries, um, uh, from Chile, um, during, during the Allende period, um, in, in Germany, um, around the, the beginning and the end of the, the First World War. Um, the centre ground, the Liberals, are a huge block on that and we need to understand how they operate and how they think. Um, so let's start with some definitions. So I think probably the best definition of, of liberals comes from Phil Oakes' song, Love Me, I'm a Liberal. I'm going to put a link to that and to everything else that I um, talk about in this video in the um, description box underneath. The whole song is absolutely brilliant and cutting, but here I'm just going to read out the introduction that he gives famously to this song when he plays it live. So he says, in every American community, you have varying shades of political opinion. One of the shadiest of these is the Liberals, an outspoken group on many subjects, 10 degrees left of centre in good times, 10 degrees the right of centre if it affects them personally. I think this beautifully captures the hypocrisy of the Liberal centre, the way these people have no um, political convictions, the way their politics is oriented around self-interest. Um, Joe Glenton, in his um, book about veterans, which I'm reading at the moment, refers to these people as having unserious politics, functionally liberal, performatively left-wing. 
I think it is important to remember that a lot of these people see themselves as left wing and that a lot of their politics is driven by a desire to preserve that, that self image in the face of um, an influx into the party of genuinely, I would say, left wing people, certainly people way to the left of them. Their um, name for themselves, surprisingly enough, is not centrist, it is moderate. Um, obviously, I'm not going to call them moderate because I don't think there's anything moderate about their um, their politics and their commitment to um, a f uh, international policies which are murderous and which include torture. The right of the Labour Party is, in the way I'm using it, a shorthand for all of those who opposed the Corbyn project. So I talked in the last video about Ralph Miliband's discussion of the contrast between um, those people who believe in a top-down politics that is really incremental, that takes kind of very small gradual steps in some kind of unspecified direction towards progress, and those of us who believe in a bottom-up movement-based politics that is genuinely radical and seeks revolutionary change within the parliamentary system as much as you can, um, and, and beyond it in lots of cases. And so what I'm talking about as a Labour right actually includes some people who voted for Jeremy Corbyn, because let's face it, the people up against him were terrible, weren't they? If you think about Owen Smith in 2016, you think about Yvette Cooper, Andy Burnham, Liz Kendall in, in 2015, these were just people who had no ideas, there was no inspiration from them. So a lot of people voted for Jeremy Corbyn, but then perhaps felt like they weren't comfortable with the kind of radical movement-based politics that actually Jeremy's ideas um, and Jeremy's leadership needed. And so ended up working in opposition to the Corbyn project and to the rest of those of us who were in support of that. Um, it also includes um, some people, I would say, who are outside the Labour Party, but who are very much aligned with the Labour right. Um, this is a lot of the commentariat class, the journalists who write their columns. Um, we have a huge number of columnists in the UK, complete excess. We could export them or we could send them for re-education after the revolution. Um, OK, so there are definitely differences within the right. There are differences around how they present, how nice they are. There are some people who will be nice to you and some people who, who will be disgusting towards people, those of us on the left. Um, and this, is, this, I think, is largely irrelevant. To me, it's largely relevant whether someone is going to phone up their mate in complaints and turn me in, or whether someone is just going to turn a blind eye to that action and tacitly support it and not support any attempts to counter it. It's whether you're willing to get your hands dirty for your political project or to want to deny it. In some ways, the honesty of those who are willing to get their hands dirty and turn us in and follow through on their commitments is a little bit easier to deal with than the people who are nice to your face but actually are not willing to stand up for you when you're under threat. There are also uh, distinctions between, um, I ideologically, between, for example, the old rights, the Blairites and the soft left. Um, so I guess you could say the old right is people like Tom Watson, you know, very much coming out of the trade union tradition, whereas in the Blairite tradition, quite anti-trade union, someone like Liz Kendall. And on the soft left, you've got someone like Lisa Nandy, I guess. Um, yeah, these these differences matter in terms of us understanding our political enemy, who the Liberal Centre are one of our political enemies, they have to be understood in that way. But for the purposes of video, I don't think they're relevant, because those groups managed to come together very effectively, and managed still to come together very effectively, in order to oppose us on the left, and in order to oppose the Corbyn project. And they did that because they see each of them, each of those other groups as legitimate and they don't see us as legitimate part of the party. So this is not going to be an exhaustive discussion about centrism. Um, please join the discussion either on Twitter or in the chat below this video. Actually, if you put comments in the it, below the video, it massively helps the, the YouTube algorithm spot it and share it with other people. And so it gets the video out. So if you value anything of what I'm saying, do, do contribute to the discussion. I'm going to try and go into as many areas as possible and I definitely crowdsourced ideas for this video on Twitter and I'd like to thank everyone who kind of gave me suggestions. I'm going to start with a question 
um, that Wolfman on Twitter came up with, which is how do they justify to themselves the Labour right preventing a left-wing Labour government? And their feelings of relief and in some cases of pleasure are lost in 2019. Now I think anyone who was in the pub on that horrible election night in 2019, um, as I was, will have seen people um, on the right who expressed, if not pleasure, in some cases pleasure, but mostly relief. You know, as the left went home, the right in Hackney, the right turned out to watch what happened. And of course, none of them came over to speak to me. Um, and they were kind of almost, it felt like they were gloating and it was, yeah, it was horrible. But I think as much as we feel this and we we would frame the question like this and we would see within the right a lack of compassion for those who now are, are homeless because of the actions of the Tories, hungry because of the actions of this brutal Tory government, even dead because of them, um, we'd see that as a judgment on, on their not supporting um, the Corbyn project and the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn, uh, they would see it as a judgment on us. They would ask how we can justify um, supporting a clearly unelectable leader like Jeremy Corbyn, who was conspiracist, who was anti-Semitic, who encouraged a party that contained abuse and bullying when people need a Labour government. So I think it really is important to stress that so much of the way we look at Labour right is from our own mindset and we have to somehow think about Labour right from their own position because nobody thinks themselves in the way we think about the right. They have to come up with kind of forms of justification for themselves, as we do for us. Um, you know, we are not how they see us. Um, and it, I think we can go back to 2017 for some insights into this. Because in 2017, I was going canvassing, as lots of us were, of course, and people on the Labour right were going out canvassing. Um, and we were not knocking on exactly the same doors, but more or less knocking the same doors. Whereas I started to see a really positive response about four weeks into the campaign, it's about halfway through, where suddenly, like, people were starting to, like, have conversations when you knock on the doors, to be pleased that you were there. Um, to ask questions, to tell you their views. And some of those people were people who'd voted Conservative in the past, and some of those were people who either hadn't voted for a while or had never voted and were either going to vote Labour this time or were thinking about it. The Labour right could not see this positive response. It really surprised them, the 2017 result. And even the day before the election, um, they were predicting a huge loss for Labour. Um, and of course, what they did was then to work very hard between um, June 2017 and December 2019 to ensure that what they had thought was going to happen in 2017 actually did happen in 2019. Um, they, we got a bad loss. We got a kicking. Um, and for them, 2017 had to be erased. It must, it still must be erased. Um, and they, they do that either just by ignoring it or by um, a narrative that dismisses it. So, for example, people only voted Labour and for Jeremy Corbyn because they knew he would not, had no chance to become Prime Minister because he, they knew we had no chance of winning. And 2019 must be constantly repeated. And it has to be interpreted in absolutely the most negative way possible. So you can't look at the number of votes. You have to look at the number of seats. Because actually you get a slightly different picture from the number of votes that Labour got compared to the number of seats. Um, you can't look at it in the broader context of the decline in Labour's vote that started in the 90s in certain areas. Um, arguably before that, but certainly in, in, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and, and you have to look at it as a isolated case of what happens when you have a leader like Jeremy Corbyn, when you present his policy platform and not just that. It has to be a judgment on the whole project. It has to be a judgment on us, on why mass membership is bad, on why it brings division, abuse, racism, conspiracism. And it has to be used as a kind of sense of this should never happen 
again in the Labour Party, how we have to close off the possibility of a leader like Jeremy Corbyn ever happening again, because this is what will happen if it does. And so now I want to go on to another question that someone on Twitter gave me, which I've been thinking about a lot from at Socially Crude. Is their behaviour a result of cognitive dissonance or outright dishonesty? So in, in 2017, when they see the difference between what they expect to happen and what actually happens, is that something where they're just being outright dishonest in not being able to see it, in not being able to come to terms with it? Or is this just a kind of state of cognitive dissonance where they kind of find a way to live with this, um, a strategy for living with this disjunction between these two things? So what I'm going to say is that there's a kind of cycle going on. So you start with um, some cognitive dissonance, which produces a need for some dishonesty, which produces more cognitive dissonance, more dishonesty. And ultimately, this whole thing is resolved through um, a commitment and belief in a kind of undemocratic approach to politics, which um, is fixated in a cult like manner on particular individuals who are seen as good people and so in whom we should put our trust. So this is my argument, so you can stop watching now. If you'd like to see more about how I got to that argument and how I justify it, then please carry on watching. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to something that Fiona Miller said. So, Fiona Miller on Twitter asked for an insight into the political vacuum that seems to exist at the heart of the Parliamentary Labour Party. We seem to be led, largely, by people faithful to a faction, not a movement, or party ideals with no clear ethos, no clear policy and no absolute values. I would um, definitely share Fiona's assessment. And I think it's very hard to get a kind of take on the Parliamentary Labour Party because we only kind of hear about them through the news most of the time. They're quite distant from us. That's quite difficult to analyse. But there is one MP who I know up close and personal, so I'm going to talk about her. She is my MP, Meg Hillier. She's not particularly famous, um, although I'm in Hackney. I think when people think of Hackney, they think of Diane Abbott. But there are two Hackney constituencies, and Diane Abbott is Hackney North, and I'm in Hackney South in Shoreditch, and Meg Hillier is the MP there. I'm going to tell you a story. This is a story which is already... I'm not giving anything away. It's already been published by Squawkbox. I'll put the link in the description. Um, and this is about the time when Meg broke the rules. So I would say Meg is a pretty typical member of the Parliamentary Labour Party. Um, she supported Yvette Cooper for the leadership in 2015. She was, I think, fairly happy to vote um, no confidence in Jeremy Corbyn in summer 2016. And she then um, signed the nomination papers for Angela Eagle's leadership challenge to, to Jeremy Corbyn. And when she dropped out on that same day that Meg signed her nomination papers, Meg signed up to Owen Smith's campaign. And the way I found out that Meg broke the rules is a little bit of a quirk of um, COVID, in a, in a sense. Because, of course, when, when we had the pandemic, when we had the lockdown, we started to have online meetings. And when we have online meetings, we have an all member meeting. So you can get easily get well over 100 people there. And it's very difficult to count votes in a Zoom meeting when people are putting their hands up like this, or maybe they're finding the hands up key on, on, on Zoom. And so we started using Zoom polls. So what Zoom polls are, you're probably familiar with them, is that a question will pop up in the center of the screen and you'll um, click on one of the responses. So you might have, for example, um, how do you vote on the education motion for, against, abstain? I think we think about the rules as very flexible if we're on the left. We see the right breaking them all the time. And that's partly true. But the rules do provide a kind of set of parameters in which, within which you have to work. And if you understand the rules, it gives you quite a lot of power on the left, even when you lack power in other ways. So I understood, as someone who understands how the late play works, that you would not be able to change 
a vote that is visible and open, like a hands up vote, for a vote that is closed. So even though a Zoom poll looks like it's closed, because you don't get to see how each person individually votes, it's actually, in theory, still open. So I asked the secretary this and he said, yes, it is. And he sent me the Zoom poll results. So we started using Zoom polls, I think, in October of 2020, it would have been. And I was getting them every month. I wasn't telling anybody this. Um, but, you know, in theory, anybody could have got them. And I don't think Meg realised that a Zoom poll is not secret. And she actually ended up voting three times in the meeting. So this was in May 2021, so earlier this year. And she voted um, on a very specific issue. And this was when we had a rule change that we wanted to bring to party conference that would make the Parliamentary Labour Party, so her and her colleagues, accountable to national conference. And this would include the WIPS report. So it would enable us to challenge when there are vindictive uses of withdrawal of the whip. So cases of examples like Jeremy Corbyn's, where there is no reason in terms of the Labour Party to withdraw the whip, but where the leader wants to um, factionally use the withdrawal of the whip as an attack on the left. It would have perhaps have allowed us, if it had passed, potentially to get the whip restored to Jeremy Corbyn. So it was very controversial. And she initially voted on whether it was legitimate to consider this as an it in the meeting because it hadn't been submitted through branches because it was um, because of the timing of the meeting. And she voted against putting it on the agenda, against debating it. Then once we had voted to debate it and then we voted on it, she voted against that. And then we had a vote on whether to extend the meeting and she voted against that. That was really childish in my view because um, she can leave the meeting at any point. She usually leaves it early. Why would she want to tell us what to do except just to close down democracy, which I guess was what she was trying to do. Um, why should we get to vote on anything else? But anyway, so those were three things she voted on. And it wasn't just that she was voting on something that is very personal to her and very, um, much about her own kind of position as an MP and a bit of a challenge to that from us. But she voted in a very, very close meeting. So there are 130 people in that meeting. Um, it was almost impossible. I couldn't work out whether left or right had a majority. In fact, it turned out the left had a majority of between 51% and 54% in all the votes in that meeting. But it could easily have been that one vote swung it. So it's clear that, that Meg thought that as well. So obviously I got the Zoom poll of that meeting and I looked at it and I was really surprised to see that Meg had voted at all and that she, specifically that she'd voted on these particular issues at this very, very, very tightly um, contested meeting. Um, I raised it with the secretary who said that he would raise it with Meg and get back to me. I chased it a couple of times and get a response. So I then raised it with the local left. Of course, at this point, I've blown my cover and everyone knows I'm getting all the Zoom polls and everyone knows I know how everyone's voted. So that was kind of fun. Um, and the left exec members took it to an executive meeting locally and raised it there. And then we got Meg's response. She wasn't present at that meeting, but this is what she said that it was a complete accident, that she has no memory of voting, and that her vote didn't count. Now, this is obviously ridiculous. Um, I would believe that, I mean, how do you put your finger up like to the screen and vote three times? Why do you do it on that particular issue? Why are all the votes in line with your politics um, if it was just like an accident? Um, and why have, does it happen in a kind of really close meeting? And obviously her vote did count because um, we didn't know she'd voted until like like a couple of weeks later when I got sent the, the poll results. And by that point, um, the results have been counted. Um, Zoom doesn't know whether she's eligible to vote or not. And if that rule change had fallen, it would have been too late to submit it. So it's complete lies. And these were the lies that she delivered 
in a general meeting that we had of all members to explain things and of course without people knowing the circumstances how would they have known that these were lies so we looked at a squawk box um, so that the conditions under which she voted came out and then we raised it again at the next meeting and then she gave the same lies and I think we all know that people lie but it is really weird when you have such obvious lies delivered in a smallish meeting like 100 people and it's really interesting the rights response to that so one response was I think we'll recognize this from the response to labor leaks which is that the problem is not the lie itself or the things revealed but the leaker so we should have an investigation into who leaked it so if you're watching this video you know it was me whatever um and another response was well it's easily done i voted by mistake in a meeting and this was a completely ridiculous thing to say because this person had voted consciously in a meeting and then someone had said oh no you're here as an observer you're not allowed to vote this is really different meg knew she had no right to vote she doesn't live within the constituency so she's not a member of the local party she just lives a little bit outside of it so she knew she wasn't allowed to vote. She's never tried to vote before. If that was a face-to-face -face meeting, there is no way she'd have put her hand up, and we all know that. Um, so, lies. Let's think about how the right deal with those lies. Now, we've seen that Keir Starmer also lies massively. He lied all throughout his leadership campaign. He has lied quite a lot since he became leader of the Labour Party, including very recently when there was a whole kind of scandal about MPs having second jobs and when he was confronted with the reality that he was considering taking a second job he pretended that oh no I thought about it but I realised it was the wrong thing to do. There's always a, uh, a police car that goes past when I'm doing these videos. Um, so yeah when Keir Starmer was confronted with the fact that he'd considered taking a second job um, he sought to suggest that he had somehow thought, oh, this is completely unethical and decided against doing so. But of course, it was Jeremy Corbyn who told him, this is a conflict of interest, do not do this. So how do the Labour right deal with the fact that the people they support are lying all the time, but they want to be able to call out lies by other people, they want to be able to call out Tory lies and hypocrisy? And I think it is about how they see lies as legitimate if they're made by particular people. So it's not the lie that you're judging, it's the person who's speaking. And if the person who's speaking is someone who's a good person, then they are entitled to lie. In fact, I think they would see Meg as entitled to vote. They would see somehow the rules as out of order. Um, you know, and they would see the problem, the thing which is illegitimate, as not being Meg's actions, but as our actions in bringing that rule change. Because we should not be seeking to have that power, to seek that accountability of our MPs, because we, we should simply be trusting them and showing deference to those in power. So this is a profoundly anti-democratic politics, um, which has a disproportionate, almost exclusive focus on elected office and particularly on parliamentary power. Um, I think if my friend Hilary Wainwright would speak about how MPs make an oath to the Queen or to the monarch um, in general, and they don't make an oath to the people. And there's a kind of hierarchy in that that um, the Labour right take on. And I think it's very important to talk about respectability in relation to this. So. Uh, it's really interesting reading about um, the first Labour government in the 1920s and when they were elected there were people within the Labour movement who were so concerned about respectability that they were giving lessons to MPs wives and of course all MPs were, were men in those days. They were giving lessons to their wives in how to um, deal with particular social situations, which cutlery to use at a dinner for example because they were so concerned about how these people would behave and that was their priority on respectability. And I think we can see that fixation on respectability in how um, someone like Keir Starmer is much more comfortable at the CBI than he is with trade unions. And what you get is a focus on people and on values, not on policies, not on movements, um, and not on people as a mass but on individuals 
who are seen as valuable people. And we talk about um, things like competence, having a forensic approach, um, being pragmatic. There's a sense in which their position is presented as mature. So recently at our meeting on housing, um, the mayor of Hackney said that housing campaigners need to grow up. And this is generally what is directed by the Labour right towards the, the Labour left and the broader left is an idea that we've never grown up, that we're stuck in some uh, perpetual adolescence, we have some form of arrested development, this is a kind of failure to mature into. And what does growing up mean? It means learning to lie, I guess. It means, yeah. And what you see here is a huge splitting between who the good people are and who the bad people are. I'm not a psychoanalyst, but I do think there is some value in thinking about it psychoanalytically, about how, how all the bad is projected onto the left. And that is why we get labelled as a rabble, as, as trots, as soap dodgers, as abusive, as conspiracist, as, as not even human. I think I want to give one more example of this. And this comes from the run up to the um, trigger ballots. So a trigger ballot um, is when you decide whether someone is going to, someone who's an incumbent, who's already in a role, is going to be the Labour candidate next time around, or whether you're going to have an open selection where that person is one of the shortlisted candidates, but you see them in relation to other shortlisted candidates and decide between them. And we were coming up to the trigger ballots for our MP, Meg Hillier, and there was a lot of phone banking going on at the time by, by various members of the Labour right. And I got some complaints. I was CLP secretary, so that means the local party secretary. Um, this is an important role, but it's uh, completely voluntary. And I was getting complaints um, from people who'd been phone banked. And what was happening was they were getting asked a series of questions. And these questions were, how do you rate Meg Hillier as an MP from one, poor to five, excellent? Question two, how do you rate Jeremy Corbyn as leader from one to five? Question three, do you support open selection? Now, it's perfectly legitimate for Meg and other people who support Meg and want to see her reselected to phone up people who are Labour Party members. She gets access to the data for that purpose. But of course, within data protection law, you have to explain to people why you're calling. And these people were not being told, I'm calling on behalf of Meg Hillier about the upcoming trigger ballot. They were being told, um, I'm calling on behalf, I am a local councillor, or I'm calling on behalf of the local councillor, I just want to talk to you about your views. Um, and it was obvious to me that this was not just some innocent local councillor calling up about what, um, calling up to try and engage people in the Labour Party, because if it was, they would be asking questions like, um, do you have any problems getting to meetings? What are your things you're interested in? Um, would you like to know more about canvassing? How can we get you involved? This is what's coming up, that kind of stuff. But um, that wasn't what was happening. These were very specific questions about a month before a trigger ballot about whether people believed in open selection, what people thought of Jeremy, what people thought of Meg. So I reported this to Region and I copied in some senior people from Labour groups, so that's senior Labour councillors in Hackney because it was being done uh, in the name of being a councillor. And of course, um, region, who are not particularly left-wing, but who are, I would say at the time, maybe not now, but at the time were pretty fair, immediately closed us down and said, yes, there's a data protection breach. But before region did that, a senior member of our Labour councillors here replied. I'm just gonna read you a little bit from their email. I have to say that I cannot see that the behaviour you describe is capable of constituting a breach of the data protection rules, given that the use to which the member's name and telephone number have been put appears to fall within the number of the profiling uses listed in the Labour Party's privacy policy. As you say below, councils are entitled to, and indeed expected to, use membership lists to understand the views of the Labour Party members in their wards. 
Understanding members' opinions of the local and national leadership, as well as Labour Party processes, seems a good way of testing those views and is relevant to understanding the particular members' likelihood of engaging further with the party. So all I want to say here is, boy, do they have to go to ridiculous contortions to justify um, these actions. I mean, they tie themselves up in knots and it's completely ridiculous. They should just say, yeah, they shouldn't have been doing that, but they can't. And, and they, they don't do that because their first instinct is this is a good person, this is someone who's on my side, this is someone who's an elected councillor, who's, who's respectable, I need to defend them. They cannot look objectively at the situation, they cannot be critical of their own side, it's a kind of cult-like um, desire to protect those they see as like them. And it's kind of a, a ridiculous contrast, as, as anyone will know who's on the left, who's ever tried to get data for phone banking, it's really hard to do that because the right will kind of like be suspicious of what you're trying to do even when you really like all we ever want to do is try to get people canvassing and try to get people to meetings and try to get people involved um, and yet we're closed down every time and they they bring all these objections because they're not looking objectively at what we're trying to do they're simply seeing us as bad people who have to be rejected and i think this desire to protect those who are are the people, the respectable people, the people who have authority, the people who've been given power through the structures of the state, as councillors, as mayors, as, as MPs. Those people are the people to whom we owe um, deference and obedience and complicit, um, deference, obedience and support. And we can see that at national level all the way through the party. Um, the way that MPs were protected from complaints, whereas members, even during the Corbyn period, whereas members were just kind of, um, yeah, as members we have no such protection um, from dodgy complaints and from malicious complaints and complaints are actually part of the bullying that we experience within the party. Um, we can see that in the gagging of local parties, so particularly I'd look at the gagging of Wallasey's local party in 2016, which really they were suspended simply to block them from um, taking an action against uh, taking any action against Andrew Eagle, who at that time was um, posing a ultimately pathetic and unsuccessful challenge to Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. Um, and obviously members of the local party were upset about that and they were suspended simply so they could not meet and could not say anything about that. We can see that, of course, in the way that actually during Jeremy Corbyn's years, one of the things people often don't realise is that there were parties that had been suspended or in special measures in a few cases for decades, um, which means they could not have their own independent meetings. All meetings had to be organised by region. They could not really exist as parties. Um, if anyone wanted to join, then they had to go through extensive kind of membership checks um, in those local local areas uh, and those were brought back into functioning um, local parties during the time of Jeremy Corbyn and Jenny Formby's leadership and that was very important and we're going very quickly back to a case where suspension is a kind of default approach not just to local parties um, but to um, individuals who are key to local parties and to making them function so we saw mass suspensions of uh, local party secretaries and chairs very quickly after, after Keir Starmer was elected leader and David Evans appointed as General Secretary of the Labour Party. And we also see it in the kind of excessive controls on what can be said at local parties. And so, as Paul Farmer said on Twitter in contribution to discussions around what could potentially be in this video, um, they, the Labour right, seem to have no actual policy platform their dialogue is simply sneers and insults aimed at their own party members. I think that's true, but there is there is no policy platform in that sense, but there is a commitment to a particular idea of a respectable person, as I'm saying, um, a particular idea of values. And it's no surprise that the breakaway Labour right group, allied with the centre centrist people within the Tory party, uh, which was called Change UK, the independent group, um, 
spoke all the time about how they are brought together by shared values and those values were completely meaningless and as soon as they got to the point where they had to um, try and convert those values into policies they fell apart and collapsed um, and I think yeah I think we can see that as a failure of the right generally um, but I do think this commitment to shared values and to people individuals who are good individuals respectable individuals partly explains the incredible fixation on deselection incredible terror around deselection for those people in the labor right that this is what the left is rapidly committed to and pursuing and i think alex nunn's um highlights this hypocrisy beautifully bottom-up efforts in a handful of local parties to democratically choose their mp represented stalinism when jeremy corbyn was leader there is now a top-down effort to purge the parliamentary labor party of the left but that's just good liberal housekeeping. So yeah, it is. You purge the people who, who have no right to be there. You defend zealously the people who should be there, who are entitled to be there. And of course, this division into good people versus bad people is factionalism. It's what underlies the really crazy levels of factionalism that you meet and encounter on the left when you enter the party directed at you from the right. Just one example of this, um, in the kind of banality of factionism, actually. We often think of factionism as happening in a kind of um, very elevated way, but it's very, very mundane and very day-to-day. -day. So there was one time when um, we were canvassing for a by-election in Hackney, council by-election, and I came back to the office quite late, and there was only a couple of people there, um, and they were just sticking around to tidy up, and I was leaving and one of them was a right-wing councillor and they said to me you have to shut the gate because if not we'll get in trouble with the neighbours and this councillor said this to me multiple times and I acknowledged it multiple times but when I went to leave this councillor followed me and watched me closing the gate. Um, now this doesn't really make sense I mean even if I had been a kind of childish person who wanted to get my own back from the Labour Party, I don't think leaving the gate open for half an hour while they were tidying up before they came out was really very effective. Um, but it wasn't really about a rational response. It was a, a feeling that I was someone who could not be trusted, that I was someone who should not be in the Labour Party, that could not, um, that it is almost not human and rational in the same way that this other person, this right-wing councillor was, and that people they associate with and feel are entitled to being a party are and therefore I had to be followed out. And so of course what's really interesting about the Labour right in terms of faction is that they don't see themselves as factional they see us as factional um, but of course they're deeply divisive but they do their divisiveness in a very specific way so every year we have our annual general meeting, our AGM for the local party, and we have had since 2016 a left slate and a right slate. Um, and the left slate is done in the name of Hackney South Grassroots Left. And since 2017, we've produced a nice shiny leaflet that we've publicised with our candidates and with our platform, what we stand for. Um, and we put it out on social media in advance of the meeting. And the right have also produced a leaflet, but they don't put it out in advance. They just hand it out outside the meeting. And there are two things that are key about the difference between their approach and our approach. So first of all, they claim to speak for the whole party. Um, they use the Labour logo on their leaflets, not all the time, but quite a lot. And they talk about we. And it's a we that is effectively the whole party. Can you imagine the level of anger that will be generated in Labour right if we use the Labour logo on a left factional leaflet for an AGM? But no, we can't do that, but they can. And they can do that because they feel entitled to do so, because they feel they are the party. They don't think they are a faction. So they are claiming the position of representing the whole party, even though they represent a minority 
faction, certainly at the time a minority faction. And the other thing that's really important is how divisive their behaviour was. So because our slate was public in advance, they, could, they didn't have enough, enough people to fill all the positions. So they could look at our slate and decide which people they thought were okay on that and put them onto their slate. And this is deeply divisive because it's saying to some parts of the left, you're the respectable part of the left, you're the part of the left that we could work with, we will put you on our slate. So what they're saying then is there's some people on the left who they deem respectable and some people who they do not deem respectable. And they're sending a message to the softer parts of, of, of our left, I guess, which is if only you could drop the connections to the crank left, I guess, the disrespectful, troublesome, difficult parts of your left, then we could all be a united party. We could leave behind this factionalism. It's a promise of unity, a very bad faith promise of unity, of course. And, and I'm very happy to say, I'm very proud that I was never put on their slate. Even the year they couldn't find anyone to run against me, I was not on their slate. Um, so what this culminated in was actually a very full-blown offer of unity before the 2021 AGM, um, in which they said, why are we putting up a left candidate, a right candidate for different positions? Why don't we, on some of the positions at least, agree in advance who's going to get which? So this is obviously really undemocratic. Why not give people in the meeting, you know, we get 200 people to an AGM, why not give those 200 people the chance to decide between the left and the right? Why have a small group of us decide that in advance? But it's also a very, very bad faith offer. So what I want to do here is introduce a concept that I found incredibly useful for understanding how the right operate, which is a unity offensive. So what a unity offensive is, is it's when a group within the labour movement makes an offer of unity. And who within the movement can be against unity, right? Obviously, unity is great. But it's done in bad faith in order to sow discord within the other group's numbers and to weaken them for some specific purpose, usually by, by driving a wedge between their hard and their soft wings. So in our case, this unity offensive, this bad faith promise of we can all work together in harmony was done to con to gain control of the local campaign forum because the positions that they wanted to take on the exec would have given them control of the local campaign forum. The local campaign forum sets the rules and the processes through which we select our council candidates. So again, what that was going to do was pr protect the right wing council candidates, the respectable people, the people to whom we should defer, to whom we owe, um, a sense of loyalty because they are our representatives rather than as the left would see it that they owe to us accountability because our, they're our representatives and it would kind of stave off challenge from the left was what they hoped. But the, the classic case of a unity offensive recently on a national level was Keir Starmer's leadership campaign. He promised us unity. He did this on, on an epic scale really. Um, he promises unity through strategy, through policies, and it was a bad faith offer of unity. It was a unity offensive. It was truly offensive. It was done, of course, because he could only win the leadership. The rights candidate, Keir Starmer, was the rights candidate. That was very clear all the way through. They were very explicit about supporting him. And he could only win if he broke away a significant chunk of the people who had supported Jeremy Corbyn because we were the majority of the party. And so he was trying to split um, and so discord within the, the our group's numbers and to weaken us, and he succeeded. And I hope that people kind of can use that example, not simply as a judgment on Keir Starmer. It is a judgment on Keir Starmer, but it's much more a judgment on what happens at that moment when the right needs to claim the party from the left and the right needs to take power again and can only do that by splitting the left and sowing discord amongst the left. And so in order to do so, must make a bad faith promise offer of unity to us. I just want to end with a couple of other very local examples to elaborate what the Labour right mean by factionalism and what, how it's very different from what we on the left mean by factionalism. 
So there was, um, remember back to when Rebecca Long Bailey was um, sacked by Keir Starmer, and I actually used Twitter to call on the mayor and my and the deputy mayors in Hackney and my councillors in Hackney to sign up to a statement that was put out by the socialist campaign group of councillors um, opposing the sacking of Rebecca Long Bailey as a factional act. And the mayor of Hackney responded. And he said, with you all the way, once you declare 100% non-factional support for Hackney Labour and oppose all motions that attack the council. So Hackney Labour on Twitter refers simply not to the whole of Hackney Labour, not to me, for example, but simply to um, our councillors and our mayor. So what he was calling for was unconditional support. The Labour right to see any kind of internal disagreement that targets people who are elected as Labour Party candidates to positions of power, to positions of state power, any disagreement with that, even privately within a meeting, they see that as factional. So they see democracy as factional. This is really important and this explains how the right's idea of unity must always be premised on the destruction of the left. Because while the left exists with a basic belief in democratic accountability, there can never be an end to factionalism, because that is factionalism for them. And the, my final example is a motion on home building, a motion supporting home building in Hackney. Who could be against that, right? It's like unity, it's like a good thing, home building. Um, and this is a kind of rare motion, because normally the Labour right don't really tell you what they think. They kind of hide it under a, several layers, because it's kind of offensive to a lot of the centre of the Labour Party who are non-factional, but who generally align with the left on policy and who, um, and they don't want to kind of give the game away, I guess. But in this case, they did. So this motion talked about the unprecedented housing crisis that's facing Hackney. Um, it talked about the number of people waiting for council homes, number of people in emergency and unsuitable accommodation. It sycophantically praised Hackney for having a huge housing delivery programme. And it resolved to campaign for an increase in home building in Hackney, encouraging well-designed, sustainable, car-free homes on vacant or underused sites, such as car parks or single-storey retail, and to push for the maximum delivery of affordable housing, such as social rent or shared ownership, workspace and social infrastructure through the planning process. Now, there's not really much reason for having this motion because this is the policy of our local council. So, you know, it doesn't really do anything to, to bring this policy position. But this was not the reason for the motion. There are three points which were the reason for the motion. I'm going to read those three points now. First one, Labour policy supports an increase in home building of all tenures with a focus on affordable housing. Nimbyism, not in my backyard, is antithesis of Labour values to act in the interests of the many, not the few. So what they were doing is saying, in this point, that if we don't support an increase in home building of all tenures, so just maximum um, private housing, okay with a focus on affordable housing, but affordable housing isn't affordable for most people. It includes mostly, mostly it's not social rent housing, it's not council housing and other forms of public housing, it's mostly um, shared ownership properties, which are well out of the reach of most of us who live in, in London. Um, it's mostly, um, if not shared ownership, then li London living rent, which again is significantly higher than social rents and not affordable to a huge number of people. But of course, if we oppose that, we are against Labour values. We are not people who are campaigning for a different policy agenda. We are NIMBYs, we are selfish. And then there were two action points, and these action points sought to transform our local party into a factional instrument. And these are the action points. The local party must condemn those who apply undue pressure on councillors, who must make decisions on planning applications solely according to policy and law. And the party is to rule out of order motions that seek to influence decisions on specific planning applications. So it's seeking to cut off any debate about um, motions that 
seek to influence planning decisions, even though that's part of the democratic process that we're supposed to have around planning, that our Labour Party is supposed to support. And not just that, but the local party should get involved in condemning people who seek to put pressure on councils, which again is something we are allowed, we are allowed to, to do, do, and it's something that I would encourage people to do. Happily, this motion did not pass um, in our local party. I don't know whether it would nowadays, it's a bit more right wing. But we can see that the Labour Party itself at national level has been turned into this factional instrument, it's been turned into the fantasies of the person who wrote this motion. It's designed to condemn the kinds of people who are not seen as respectable. It's designed to sort those who are respectable from those of us who are other to respectability. Um, and to not just condemn us, but to bully us, to apply ridiculous pressure to us through the disciplinary system, and to use suspension and investigation on an industrial scale to use the weaponization, um, the instrumental instrumentalization of anti-Semitism to do that, which has absolutely nothing to do with any kind of authentic attempt to tackle anti-Semitism, quite the opposite. And we can see it also in the reintroduction of prescription. So prescription is when certain groups are defined as, um, the membership of those groups is defined as antithetical to, to being in the Labour Party, but there are two differences in how prescription is being used in this case um, to in the past. So first of all, it's not simply about membership of an organisation, it's any association with that group. So giving an interview as, um, so giving an interview to um, a paper or a magazine or a website for that group would count and it's being, or even signing up to an open letter that they put out or a petition they put out can be used. Um, it's, it's, it's extreme guilt by association, it's very McCarthyite. And it's being applied retrospectively, so groups which until very recently, such as Socialist Appeal, were integral to the Labour Party. Socialist Appeal were the part of militant that stayed in the Labour Party way back in the day, in I guess the 1980s, when a huge, when the leaders of, of Militant were expelled and where some p members of Militant decided to separate and form the Socialist Party and to not be part of the Labour Party, some people stayed in. So Socialist Appeal has been an integral part of, of the, the broad church of the Labour Party, but now they're retrospectively defined as outside of that. And all of this, of course, is being done in the name of anti-Semitism, fighting anti-Semitism. So what we can see in the Labour right is a failure to present a positive agenda. We can see that in housing motion, which is just saying, yeah, let's build more houses, let's build them everywhere. Let's try and get some shared ownership, and maybe a little bit of social housing if we can. And we see that, of course, in Keir Starmer, there is no positive agenda. What we have in place of that is a kind of messianic faith in good people, a cult-like devotion to our parliamentary Labour Party, although not, of course, people like Jeremy Corbyn, Zara Sultana and the rest of the left. Um, so, okay, so if you've listened to that, thank you so much for getting to the end. Um, if you think there was anything of value in this, please like the video, please share it, please comment. Um, if you think I should be doing more videos, please tell me. Um, I don't know whether I'm going to, I will see again about the response to this one. But I really appreciate being in dialogue with so many wonderful comrades and um, yeah, and, and so absolutely huge thanks, huge solidarity, huge love.